I have some slides that I need to prepare um, in terms of putting them up on the screen. So let me see if I can just figure it out. Put this on the I think we're set. Can people hear me okay if I speak at this volume? All right. Good. So uh, I first have to say before I get into any material what a great honor it is to be able to, to speak here. And uh, when I look around the room, I see people who have been working on this issue for far longer than I have been, and from whom I've learned a great deal and continue to learn a great deal. And I especially want to thank Marilyn, which I don't know where she's sitting. Huh? Marilyn, thank you for inviting me to speak. It really means a lot. Another funny thing about speaking to this particular group is that hardly anything I can say that you don't know already. Uh, <laughs> someone here doesn't know better than I do. So what I thought I might do is do a bit of a, a, a sort of smorgasbord of different things, get some stuff on the table. I'm not going to use it the whole time, and hopefully we'll have 30 or 40 minutes to have a bit of a conversation or discussion to maybe pick up some of those individual things and look at them from different angles and see if we can learn something in conversation together. So I want to talk about uh, the religious freedom angle of this debate, um, which I think is going to come to a head pretty soon because of developments uh, taking place now in Detroit, Michigan, concerning uh, a Muslim group that practices both male and female genital cutting. And so there's a sort of collision course that's been brewing for easily uh, over a decade, and I think that collision course is essentially here. So I thought maybe we should get ahead of that and talk about the different ways this might play out once uh, the crash occurs. So I'm beginning here with um, a, a schematic. And I'm doing that is just to keep at the forefront of our minds that genitals come in different shapes and sizes. And uh, there is not a, a sort of clear and obvious binary that people tend to um, refer to in the popular discourse. And that's going to become very important in the sort of next stages of this debate as well. Um, so let me just sort of show you what we have here. On the left side, you have stereotypically male genitals, penises, and penis-like structures. Over on the right side, you have stereotypically female genitals, and then you have these sort of gradient cases in the middle. Um, a certain proportion of babies are born each year with so-called intersex conditions or, or atypical uh, genitalia with respect to these, these stereotypes. Um, uh, and all of these kinds of genitals can be modified for what are sometimes called medically unnecessary reasons. And uh, I'll just sort of walk through some of these different ways in which Genitals of all types are sometimes modified in this way. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have uh, male genital cutting occurs uh, in two major world religions, Judaism and Islam, as well as in the United States as a sort of cultural practice, as we know. It also takes place in, uh, throughout the African continent and parts of the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And uh, over here on the right-hand side, we have uh, uh, also, some overlap with some uh, Muslim groups, but not others, that practice both male and female genital cutting. And that's the case that I'm going to be spending the most time sort of talking about today. In the group in, in question, the Dawoodi Bora, they refer to both uh, male and female circumcision with the same word, katna. Uh, the form of cutting they do on their girls is less invasive than what they do to their boys, um, but both are motivated by religious motivations and supported by similar scriptural passages, which I'll get more specific about in a little bit. Uh, you also find female genital cutting throughout the African continent, also in uh, the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And uh, in this context, 
it, it's not all cases, but a very typical scenario is that um, these sorts of uh, genital cutting practices occur in uh, parallels, a rite of passage or initiation into adulthood. And uh, I've been surprised recently to, to find that one difference between them is that on balance it seems that the male genital cutting rituals tend to be more deadly than the female ones. And I want to pause on this for a moment just because with respect to the legal situation, it's often presumed that female genital cutting is categorically more harmful than male genital cutting. And this is often raised as a reason why it's appropriate that the law should treat these forms of cutting differently. Um, someone might be able to correct me if I'm wrong. I've been digging into this for a while, and I, I can't get very clear statistics on what exactly the mortality rate is for female genital cutting as a rite of passage in this African context. There's a recent fairly thorough review uh, published here in Population that I thought was a, a, a rich and uh, fair assessment of the available literature. And I found uh, down in a footnote on page 262 that infant and childhood mortality linked to FGM is poorly measured and is invisible in mortality statistics for the affected countries. So there's clearly a measurement problem here. It's certainly not the case that no one is dying, but um, we don't know how many are and in virtue of which kinds of procedures. Um, the data for the male case, I'm just picking one chart that's available from one province in one country. This is uh, South Africa and refers to the COSA uh, initiation rite. And these are the figures just on a six month by six month basis. So if you look over on the right hand side, you see deaths 23, 13, 14, 20, 21, 17. In the middle column, you have mutilations. And by this, uh, this is refers to very extreme mangling and disfigurement of uh, the penis so that it's essentially non-functional. They don't count that the loss of foreskin, obviously, is a mutilation in this chart. So um, this is just something to keep in mind uh, about the sort of wide range of practices that occur along that spectrum I, I, I held at the beginning. And this is complicating the legal situation in a, in, a, in a Western context, which presumes a very clear dichotomy between these forms of cutting. Uh, another difference is that female genital cutting is not uh, common in Judaism. There may be some exceptions among some Ethiopian Jews as it happens, um, but uh, generally speaking, not associated with Judaism. Also not a common practice in the United States, unless uh, you want to refer to what's sometimes called cosmetic female genital surgeries. And there's been a burst of research recently suggesting that uh, what's characterized as cosmetic cutting uh, is, is done increasingly to younger and younger girls in the United States and England and other such cases. And so the line here between supposedly adult consensual cosmetic enhancement and uh, sort of culturally uh, informed cutting of younger and younger girls, uh, the, the sort of Western, non-Western dichotomy is also breaking down. Um, and then the other big difference is this one, is the legal difference. Uh, cutting on the male end of the spectrum is legal everywhere, mostly unregulated. You don't need to have a medical license to perform uh, male genital cutting if it's characterized as a circumcision. Uh, I had read that in South Africa there was some restriction, that in fact under the age of 16 circumcision was prohibited for boys, but I was in South Africa recently and I did some digging around and some asking around. And as it turns out, there's an exception for uh, religious practice and also an exception for so-called health reasons. In other words, um, anyone who wants to perform a circumcision on a, an underage boy can appeal to one of these two reasons. So it, in, in essence, there's, although there's a, in name some sort of uh, restriction, there isn't in practice. Over on the right-hand side, uh, when you look at the, the uh, female end of the spectrum, um, all such forms of cutting, so long as they're done for what are called non-medical reasons, which is a very complicated kind of messy phrase, uh, th these are criminal offenses, sometimes carrying life sentences, um, as in the case that I'll discuss shortly. Uh, the United States, UK are characteristic in this regard, um, but the United Nations has sort of asked that all member states uh, officially ban uh, female genital cutting of any kind, sometimes even when it's uh, done uh, by uh, at the request of an adult uh, woman, and that's the true in the UK and in Australia, which is sort of troubling. It equates the uh, consent capacity of adult women with um, girls sort of paternalistic. Um, in the middle here, we have intersex cases, and this is very confusing currently, because some forms of intersex genital cutting just are FGM on the available definition from the World Health Organization. So if you have a healthy child with a larger than average clitoris, but no functional difficulties, and this clitoris is essentially shaved down or cut down through clitoroplasty, um, when this is not done to restore or preserve any kind of function, that, that just is a form of female genital mutilation, but it's not treated as such legally. That's becoming more and more controversial. So because of very good scholarship and people uh, drawing uh, lines between 
the male side of the spectrum and the middle of the spectrum and the female side of the spectrum, intersex cases are becoming more controversial, and I think that that's, uh, that's appropriate. Now, of course, there aren't just sort of six stages of intersex cases. This is really more of a spectrum. And what I've been trying to highlight in recent work is, is this question here. Um, at what point does a small penis, which is legal to cut in uh, just about every Western regime, become a large clitoris, which is illegal to cut? And uh, the answer is that there's no strict location where that is. It's just an arbitrary cutoff. And so uh, I think this is going to pose serious problems for the law being able to defend a sex-based distinction in which sorts of interventions are allowed and which are not. So I'm just going to suggest in this talk that sex-based legal distinctions are heading for a collision course uh, with defenders of male and female genital cutting now sort of regrouping and uh, appealing to religious freedom as a way, a sort of last stand against some of these other uh, arguments that are beginning to break down. Now this notion of a collision, collision course goes back at least to Dina Davis back from 2001, and this paper is not cited enough. It's a really thorough, uh, carefully argued, sort of disturbing paper um, that I'm surprised is not uh, uh, read more. Uh, Dina Davis pointed out that federal and state laws that criminalize genital alteration on female minors are so broad in their language that they cover even procedures that are significantly less substantial than newborn male circumcision. And she says that a complete laissez-faire attitude toward one practice coupled with total criminalization of the other runs afoul of the free exercise of religion clause of the First Amendment. And there are also troubling implications, she writes, for a constitutional requirement of equal protection because the laws appear to protect little girls but not little boys from religious and culturally motivated surgery. So she illustrates this with a, a series of matched cases, which I think are um, evocative enough that I just want to walk you through them because they really make the point very well. Um, she says, let's suppose we match up a deeply religious Muslim couple who wish to have their daughter genitally altered and who believe it is a religious obligation and who are willing to accept a relatively minor procedure with a deeply religious Jewish couple, on the other hand, who wish to have their son genitally altered because they believe it is a religious obligation. It's hard to justify why the first couple's wish is illegal and the second's is not. She says, if we imagine that the Muslim girl's experience will be a tiny nick with proper pain control in a hospital context, while the Jewish boy's experience will be a somewhat larger operation by a non-medical practitioner without adequate pain control, or in some cases any pain control, uh, the justification becomes even more difficult. All right, let's uh, look at our second case now. We have a Jewish couple who are planning a surgical operation without the attendant ritual by a physician who's not a moil. Nonetheless, if questioned about their decision, they insist that it's part of being Jewish and that leaving their boy unaltered is unthinkable. They don't know if they will ever join a synagogue or educate the boy religiously or have him bar mitzvah, but they do know that leaving him uncut will make him look odd to his Jewish friends, may have a negative effect on his ability to marry a Jewish girl, and will bring down the wrath of their parents. Okay, match that couple with a couple from Sub-Saharan Africa who are vague about their religious beliefs but have a general feeling that to leave their little daughter uncut is somehow non-Islamic, just as it would be for their son. Further, they have good reason to fear that their daughter, if left uncircumcised, will be laughed at, perhaps ostracized, and have a very difficult time marrying within their culture. Again, what is the justification for respecting the first couple's mix of beliefs and custom, but not the second? Well, these cases were set up as sort of hypothetical comparisons, but there's now a case, as I alluded to before, that's essentially testing exactly this comparison, and this is now coming up before uh, the, the legal scene in the United States uh, concerning uh, this woman here and some, some others who are members of the Dawudu Bora sect, the Shia sect uh, of uh, Muslims who are based primarily in, in uh, India and Pakistan but have immigrated to other parts of the world, including Detroit. This is the first federal FGM case in the U.S. Um, the, the form of cutting the, the alleged crime occurred in a clinical setting by a doctor. Uh, the Bora practice what they call katna on both boys and girls for religious reasons, appealing to similar scripture in support of that. And uh, the typical male operation, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, is far more invasive than the typical female operation in this group, but only the female operation is regarded as criminal in the United States. So this is one of the first available somewhat comprehensive surveys of uh, the practice in the Dawudi Bora community. And I just want to say a little bit about its origin. The, the authors of this report, who did a survey of, of uh, some three to 400 uh, women, consist of a, a social worker, a researcher, two filmmakers, and a journalist who had all been speaking out in their own ways against the practice of katna. 
As their collaboration grew, they realized the need for an organized, uh, informed forum with the community that could help drive a movement to bring an end to Katna. So these are reformers from within the community, sort of bravely sticking their necks out and saying, we'd like to see this practice come to an end. It's also relevant, though, because uh, when you look at this research and the sort of way they describe the practice, because these are individuals who'd like to see the practice end, they would have a motivation to sort of potentially oversell and exaggerate uh, the harms, uh, but they don't do that. They're very uh, cautious and conservative in, in, in saying what they find. And here's what they state. In most instances, the process involves the removal of a pinch of skin from the clitoral hood at the age of seven, or between the ages of six and 12. Uh, and then with respect to religious significance, while the Quran, Islam's holy book, does not sanction FGC, the Daim al-Islam, a religious text followed by this community, does endorse the practice. So they don't sort of hedge and say, oh, it's not really religious as, as, as the kind of uh, narrative quickly goes. They say, no, it's a religious practice within this group. Nevertheless, we'd like to see it stop. So here's just a graph of their findings. Interestingly, 65% of the women who were surveyed uh, did, didn't know if, uh, what type of FGC had been performed. Um, but among those who, who were confident in their view, the, the vast majority of them stated that it was part of the control hood that had been removed in their group. Now, just a note about this sample, these 309 who were surveyed were essentially uh, uh, recruited through a snowball sampling method, which means friends of friends of friends of friends sort of invited each other. So the initial group of researchers asked 10 people that they knew well, and then said if you could get 10 more people from, from each of you, and then they kind of go out that way. So again, these are, these are folks who are, who are uh, willing to speak about the practice at all, which in this particular community is, is highly stigmatized and, and looked down upon. Um, and, and so that needs to be kept in mind when interpreting these results. It's not a representative sample. So I just want to ask what the legal implications are about what we've been discussing so far with respect to this issue of religious freedom. And to do that, I just want to go back a few years to a precedent case carried out in England. Uh, this is the matter of B and G. And what's interesting about this case is it covers facts that are almost exactly identical to the ones that are now uh, being, being uh, addressed in Detroit. The, the first U.S. federal case, so it will be very interesting to see how the U.S. federal prosecutors and the defense attorneys negotiate um, the, the legal questions in light of um, an earlier case that covered similar facts. So this is Sir James Munby, a senior British judge in Leeds, uh, sitting on the, the family court. And this was the question facing the judge. Uh, was uh, a girl uh, subjected to type 4 FGM, and this is that hodgepodge category with nicking and pricking and scraping and so forth. Um, and this is the way that the judge reasoned. He said, well, the family are Muslims, so the girl's FGM type 4 had it been proved, and in the end they weren't able to find any evidence that indeed she had been subjected to any form of genital cutting, so the case was dismissed on those grounds. But he reasoned nevertheless, uh, had that been proved, it would have been relied upon by the local authority as justifying the adoption of both her and her brother, B, even though on any objective view it might be thought that G would have been subjected to a process much less invasive no more traumatic, if indeed as traumatic, and with no greater long-term consequences, whether physical, emotional, or psychological, than the process to which B has been or will be subjected. So here's the problem that was identified by the judge. He says, circumcision of the male is the removal of some or all of the prepuce foreskin, the retractable fold of skin that surrounds and covers the glands of the penis so as to expose the glands. Circumcision involves the removal of a significant amount of tissue, of some dozens of uh, square centimeters of very sensitive tissue, uh, creates an obvious alteration to the appearance of the genitals and leaves a more or less prominent scar around the circumference of the penis. It can readily be seen that although FGM of WHO types 1, 2, and 3 are all very much more invasive than male circumcision, he has a sort of caveat about one form of type 1, uh, which is sort of um, the form I've been talking about, which is modification of the pectoral hood. But nevertheless, he says, at least some forms of type four, for example, pricking, piercing, and incising, are in any view much less invasive than male circumcision. Well, given the comparison between what's involved in male circumcision and FGM WHO type four, to dispute that the more invasive procedure, and here he's referring to male circumcision, involves the significant harm involved in the less invasive procedure, uh, namely uh, the female genital cutting, would seem almost irrational. So in my judgment, if FGM type four amounts to significant harm, as in my judgment it does, then the same must be so of male circumcision. Now this was a significant moment in British law because it's the first time male circumcision has ever been described as a significant harm. But uh, the judge was clearly very uncomfortable at having followed the train of his own reasoning because he reached a conclusion that's sort of unsayable and that's certainly inconsistent with the 
predominant narrative in, in Western discourse generally. And so you could tell that he sort of wanted to rescue the distinction and see if he could get himself somewhat back toward the regular way of speaking about things whereby male and female genital cutting are treated in these hermetically sealed separate discourses. So here's how he tried to rescue the distinction. He says, well, FGM has no medical justification and confers no health benefits. Male circumcision is seen by some, although opinions are divided, as providing hygienic or prophylactic benefits. And then he makes the, the kind of classic move to the culture versus religious distinction. He says, well, FGM has no basis in any religion, which just as, as a sentence, that's, that's a very poorly researched sentence. That's just not true. Um, on, on any reasonable conception about what it would mean for practice to have a basis in religion. So this is the power of dominant narratives to shape the thinking of even clearly very thoughtful judges who are interested in the nuance. Uh, he says, male circumcision is often performed for religious reasons. I just want to flag this at the beginning. Male circumcision is, of course, also performed for, for what you might call merely cultural reasons. That's predominantly how it's done in the United States and also among sort of non-practicing Jews and Muslims who do it for merely cultural reasons. In those cases, it's, it's equally tolerated. So it's not the case that people say, well, okay, for, for those for whom it's a, a very important religious practice, that's okay, but all these sort of merely cultural male circumcisions, we should stop doing those. So this sort of uh, appeal to a distinction between the two it seems a little bit disingenuous to me because it clearly isn't, isn't a motivating factor when evaluating um, the male case. Now, uh, with uh, Michael Thompson and, and Jennifer Hendry, I have a sort of journal article that came out with just point by point going through the Munby decision. I won't go through all the details, and if you want to look at this, uh, Georgian mentioned academia.edu. All my papers are free there, and you can kind of read it at your leisure. But the main points I try to make is that with respect to health benefits, the apparent distinction whereby male circumcision has been associated with at least some health benefits and female genital cutting has no health benefits um, is, it cannot validly be used to justify differential treatment by the law because it's largely a consequence of the current legal situation whereby they're treated fundamentally differently. So let me explain. Um, if you remove any tissue from the body, it won't become infected. And it's plausible that removing tissue from many different parts of the body would confer some health benefit in the sense that the incidence of some problem affecting that part of the body might be reduced. Um, oh, I seem to have muted myself. Ah, there we go. So consider the case of neonatal labiaplasty. Now, you can't perform neonatal labiaplasty. You certainly can't conduct a study or a randomized control trial to see if any health benefits might follow from neonatal labiaplasty, but, but they very well might. Um, it's not implausible to think that, for example, uh, cancers of the labia would be reduced if you reduce the surface area of the labia. So I, I, just on anatomical grounds, this is a, a perfectly plausible hypothesis, but it's, it's right that it's illegal to find this out because it would be immoral to remove the labia of young girls to sort of investigate or query whether there might be some health benefits that would follow from that. But in cultures where FGC is common, the medical establishment uh, routinely associates health benefits with the cutting. So uh, uh, Stephen here and uh, Rob Darby, who I finally got to meet in Australia a couple months ago, and that was really fun to get to meet Rob after all these years, writing papers with him long distance. Uh, they've pointed out that you can find appeals to a lower risk of vaginal cancer, less nervous anxiety, fewer infections from microbes gathering under the hood of the clitoris, and protection against herpes and genital ulcers. I'm, oh, I've done it again. There we are. Uh, with respect to the Dawoodi Bora in particular, uh, Tasneem Raja, who is a member of the community and a former editor at NPR, says that, well, some Bora women believe that female circumcision has something to do with removing bad germs and liken it to male circumcision, which is widely believed within this group to have hygienic benefits. Now, none of this is to say that female genital cutting uh, has net health benefits. I don't think that's the case, but nor do I think that's the case about male genital cutting. So whenever you hear the claim that FGM has no health benefits, and this has become kind of a mantra for the World Health Organization, if you follow them on Twitter, for example, they have a new article every day saying FGM has no health benefits, only causes harm. And it all sounded strange to my ears. I thought, why are they harping on about no health benefits? And I realized why, and I'll explain why in a moment. But what you should read that as saying is we don't actually know if certain minor sterilized forms of FGM have health benefits because it's unethical and would be illegal to find out if that were true. And here's, here's what I realized was bothering me. The mantra is really disingenuous. And the reason why I say that is because if there were health benefits, if somebody came along and had some convincing evidence that female genital cutting of one kind or another prior to an age of consent conferred some kind of health benefits, I really don't think it's the case that anti-FGM campaigners would suddenly say it's permissible. They go, oh, well, I, I guess if there's health benefits, it's okay then. 
that's certainly not the case. They would say, rightly, it's wrong to do this because it damages healthy genital tissue and violates the bodily integrity of the girl without her consent. And that's true regardless of whether health benefits might or might not follow. That's clearly how the response would go. And so I think all this dwelling on the issue of no health benefits is a bit of a red herring. But more than that, I think there's a risk of repeating this mantra in every context. And that's that if defenders of female genital cutting come to think that health benefits make the cutting seem okay to Westerners, they will conduct the necessary research to find them. And as I've suggested, it's not implausible that they would. Uh, this is especially true when you think of the sort of broad way that health gets interpreted, including actually the World Health Organization's definition of health, which is sort of like total bodily and spiritual well-being rather than some sort of narrow physical notion. So if you look at the literature now on uh, cosmetic labiaplasty in Western medical journals, you find abundant claims of health benefits in terms of mental health. So they'll say, well, obviously, if uh, a, a woman feels uh, 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 enhanced cosmetically, this will have uh, many beneficial consequences for her uh, mental well-being. And this actually falls well within the World Health Organization definition of health. And so you could just do citations right now and build a case of health benefits for F FGC as long as you want to construe health widely. And as I say, even if you construe it narrowly, it may very well be that there are health benefits there too. So I've written this piece here, which I guess is sort of unfortunately titled because um, I got uh, some very angry responses on Twitter from people who clearly had not read anything in the article, but thought that I was somehow proposing that female genital mutilation had health benefits, when the second part of the sentence, which says the problem with medicalizing morality, was trying to suggest that that should sound like a very silly question. It should sound like a wrong question. Why are you even asking if it has health benefits? It's like a category error. That's not the concern. Uh, so in this, I, I raise a couple of points. I first draw attention to uh, Fong Bai Hamadou's work where she has uh, shared the view of one woman in her research who, who says, uh, uh, why would any reasonable mother want to burden her daughter with excess clitoral and labial tissue that's unhygienic, unsightly, and interferes with sexual penetration, especially if the same mother would choose circumcision to ensure healthy and aesthetically appealing genitalia for her son? Uh, similarly, as I go on to say in the article, uh, the women in societies that practice what they call female circumcision are, are just as devoted to their cultural traditions as are the men who practice genital cutting of boys. They don't want their customs banned either. And of course, I'm referring to those who hold that view, not to reformers, and the uh, homogenizing tendency in a lot of this discourse is, is, is problematic. But for those who support female genital cutting, um, it's no less important to them than uh, those who support male genital cutting. If medical benefits are sufficient to ward off condemnation, a very, what you're doing is creating a strong incentive to seek them out. And I just think that that's a risk that we should be very mindful of. Okay, well, hasn't male circumcision been associated with a whole bunch of health benefits? In this crowd, I don't need to go through all this, and so that's a whole separate talk that I won't give. Um, the main points that are familiar to, to all of you is that most of the evidence that's worth even giving serious consideration to concern uh, adult circumcisions, which nobody here objects to on ethical grounds, although I will say that there's rather coercive campaigning going on where a lot of men are not uh, getting to make this decision under genuine conditions of informed consent. There's a lot of body shaming going on as part of the official campaign um, and so forth, so I'm very concerned about that. But let's just say in principle, if, a, if an adult man were making an informed decision, I don't think anyone would object to that. The key issue also, if all you care about is the medical benefit question is, is, is net benefit, not some benefit. Like I said, there's probably some health benefit from removing most parts of the body, but that has to be weighed against the disadvantages of doing that, which are not only physical, but also psychological and sexual and moral. So as we know, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics is the only uh, organization, uh, relevant organization that claims that there are indeed net medical benefits for newborn circumcision. The CDC released a, draft, uh, released a draft policy that wasn't uh, peer reviewed and has never been finalized. And I, I sort of don't get the impression that it will be. Um, if anyone has any information about what the fate is of the CDC draft, uh, I'd like to hear it. Uh, European, British, Australasian, Canadian medical associations disagree with the AAP. They either say that the benefits do not outweigh the risks, the risks outweigh the benefits, they're closely balanced, we don't know. Um, uh, Canada actually has moved a step further. The Canadian Urological Association has now come out with a further sort of policy after the Canadian Pediatric Society one, which is um, more carefully researched and reaches a similar conclusion that the benefits don't outweigh the risks. And as we know, uh, at least some of these European colleagues have suggested that the AAP might be culturally biased. So this is the sort of famous article that we throw around a lot. 
there's all these big wigs that say that AAP might be culturally biased. And so their main conclusion was this. Uh, to these authors, only one of the arguments put forward by the AAP has some theoretical relevance to infant male circumcision, namely the possible protection against urinary tract infections in infant boys. The other claimed health benefits are questionable, weak, and so forth, and are, uh, do not represent compelling reasons for surgery before boys are old enough to decide for themselves. Now, uh, when we cite this, some of those who are in favor of male circumcision will point out that, well, the AAP responded, and you never mentioned their response. So I'm just going to mention their response and show why it's not very convincing. So here's what the AAP said in response. They said, all of the commentary authors, they miss Noni McDonald, who's from Canada, but um, they hail from Europe, where the vast majority of men are uncircumcised and the cultural norm clearly favors the uncircumcised penis. In contrast, approximately half of US males are circumcised and half are not. Therefore, the cultural bias in the United States is much more likely to be a neutral one than that found in Europe, where there's a clear bias against circumcision. So, they first made a bit of an error. The, the accusation was that the people on the panel actually making the decision were culturally biased, not that generally in the United States some sort of 50-50 representation uh, would, would lead to um, a, a neutral view. But I just want to dwell on this for a second. I, I don't think it's right to say that the cultural norm in Europe favors the uncircumcised penis as a specific thing. It favors also uncircumcised female genitalia, and it favors uh, non-surgically altered body parts generally. So I, I think it's just a bit weird to sort of treat this as though it's a distinct category, the lack of which is a norm in Europe. So here was my response to the, the AAP <laughs> reply. And it, 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 was, it bothered me for so long that I, I decided to write a paper with David Shaw where I just kind of went through there, uh, reasoning piss, piece by piece. Well, piss is right too. Um, so here's just a few highlights of what David and I argue. So we say, well, let's just simply grant that there is indeed this cultural norm in Europe that clearly favors the intact penis, notwithstanding that we shouldn't grant it, but even if we do for the sake of argument. It doesn't follow from this, as the AAP task force implies, or rather states, that its European counterparts are biased against circumcised penises. The reason for this is that whatever the wider cultural norm concerning circumcision happens to be in Europe, there's also a relevant medical norm, not only in Europe, but also in the United States, which holds that medically unnecessary surgeries should generally not be performed on healthy children, and surgery should almost always be a last resort rather than a first resort for managing or preventing disease. So it's not just a matter of two local arbitrary cultural norms being pitted against one another. Rather, the shared norms governing responsible medical practice in Western countries are typically biased against such non-therapeutic procedures. So by suggesting that a cultural norm that favors the non-therapeutic surgical modification of a child's penis is somehow on par with, or just as reasonable as, a medical ethical norm favoring the avoidance of such surgery unless it's absolutely required, the AAP task force just shows its cultural hand. Okay, so what about this culture versus religion distinction that the, the uh, British judge appealed to to sort of rescue the distinction between male and female forms of genital cutting? Well, it's, it's often said that there's no mention of FGC in the Quran. There's also no mention of MGC in the Quran. Uh, and this is taken as evidence that the practice is not religious. And this is just a, a bad argument. And I, I'm really surprised to see it trotted out all the time. Just as in Judaism and Christianity, perceived binding religious obligations can arise from oral teachings and extra-biblical sources, so rabbinic teachings or papal encyclicals, Islam too looks to other sources to interpret and supplement Quranic teachings, such as the Hadith, the prophetic sayings of Muhammad. So as we saw before, um, this comes from the, the reformers within the Dawudi Bora, sort of acknowledging that the Daim al-Islam, which is one of these Hadith, is a religious text um, that, that uh, is perceived as, as creating this uh, binding uh, obligation within that community, and it endorses the practice. So making a more general point, Alex Meyer says, in Sunni Islam, the dominant branch, uh, two of the four schools of jurisprudence consider type one female circumcision to be obligatory, this is sort of modification of the plural prepuce, while the other two schools recommend the practice, and the scriptural support for this is no weaker than that for male circumcision within Islam. So both are derived from the secondary source of Islamic law, and neither is to be found in the Quran. So if we defer to religious justifications, we'll find that in many cases, the circumcision of female as well as male children could be permitted on that basis. Now some might take this to be a reductio ad absurdum of the argument from religion, but others might very well bite the bullet. Well, with Arian Shabisi, we have a, a chapter that we have coming out where we sort of explore this issue a bit further. So I'll, I'll walk you through some of our points. We say, well, this creates a dilemma. 
If male circumcision should be permitted generally and for any reason, because in some groups it is regarded as an explicitly religious practice, then relatively more mild forms of FGC that are regarded by some groups as a religiously required practice should be given equal consideration and should also be tolerated for all groups regardless of the reason. Just by parity of reasoning, that should be the case. Indeed, some prominent defenders of ritual male circumcision aware of the existing double standard have recently begun to argue that mild forms of female genital cutting should in fact be tolerated in Western law, presumably to ensure that the legal status of male circumcision remains unquestioned. Now, alternatively, one might argue that male circumcision should only be permitted when it's done for explicitly religious reasons, which would exclude most US American circumcisions, and might also exclude sort of non-religious Jewish and Islamic circumcisions that would other be done for otherwise done for cultural reasons. I realize that the religion cultural divide in these cases is, is not so simple, um, but that's sort of my point generally. Uh, in which case, by analogy, uh, only groups that regard FGC as religiously required would be permitted to perform the cutting, and all others would be disallowed. Finally, one could argue that neither male nor female non therapeutic childhood genital cutting should be per uh, permitted regardless of the religious motives of the parents. And you kind of have to make one of these moves. There aren't so many other uh, gestures in logical space you can make. So we write, whatever option one favors, the common emphasis in this discourse on religion versus culture is telling. The apparent assumption is that religious norms are categorically different from and more important than merely cultural norms. But it's not obvious that there is a firm line, uh, whether in practice or conceptually, between what is religious and what is cultural. Nor is it obvious that one should be elevated above the other as a legitimate grounds for cutting the genitals of a child. Now, whose religion are we talking about anyway? Um, a common point in this group is that uh, the religion and culture of the parents is not always shared by children as they grow up. Many people sort of move away from the religious and cultural affiliations with which they were raised. Some recent research from Pew suggests that, well, in the US public, uh, in general, people are becoming less religious. The nation's youngest adults are, by many measures, much less religious than everybody else. And so this just creates a sort of um, in empirical concern, that is, if you as a parent presume that your child will grow up to share your religious commitments such that they will appreciate a permanent marking on their body reflecting this uh, religious affiliation, um, this is just a contestable thing that seems less and less likely to be true. More generally, I've been describing this as a problem of instability, and, and the instability I mean is this. The sorts of factors that shape people's attitudes and preferences about genital cutting are not stable in multicultural societies where people have ready access to other points of view through the internet or whatever, and there's room also for considerable individual variation even within a given a cultural or religious group. And the implication of this is that if you change your religious or cultural affiliation because you either move to another place and are exposed to new ideas or you just gain a different perspective, your frame of reference for interpreting your own genital modification may change. And what this means is that some people who grew up in a relatively closed uh, community whereby they were told that their genital modification was, was normal or even an enhancement or an improvement and may very well have believed that for much of their lives, at some point they come to gain a different perspective and recast what had happened to them as being rather a diminishment or even a mutilation. Um, this comes out nicely, uh, depressingly, uh, in this uh, exploratory survey that I mentioned earlier, and I'll just share one of these stories with you. As the years rolled by, I attained puberty, and after experiencing my first menstruation, I became aware of my sexuality. At this point of time, my second eldest sister, in order to give me an understanding of sexual knowledge, gave me a book to read, Encyclopedia of Sexual Knowledge, authored by Dr. Vandevelt. After reading that book, the full impact and realization of that awful, painful, and life-changing procedure, which I was made to undergo at the innocent age of seven years, dawned on me. I was privately distraught and enraged to learn that I had been robbed of my basic feminine rights to sensuality and sexuality. This feeling disturbs and traumatizes me even today. I feel robbed and cheated of my sexuality, and feelings of inadequacy and incompleteness remain with me till today, even at the age of 61. The emotions of impotent rage and anger refused to leave my mind or my spirit. After making a private self-examination, I found that the prepuce or the entire foreskin of my clitoris had been cut off. I've given short shrift to intersex cases primarily because there are others in the room who are more expert in this than I am and will be talking about it later, but let me tell a story. I had never heard about this growing up. No one had ever talked about this. So that summer I went back home and talked to my mom about it. 
She remembered that the doctors had suggested a surgery in order to fix what they called a disorder, and she thought it was just a correction for something that might have gone a little bit wrong. However, nothing was wrong with me. I have a natural variation of sex. They just used that language in order to fit me into an imagined sex binary, thinking that it would be better for me. But it actually has created a lot of harm for me and for many other people. Finally, a story uh, told to uh, Ron Goldman. The shock and surprise of my life came when I was in junior high school and I was in the showers after gym. I wondered what was wrong with those penises that looked different than mine. I soon realized I had a part of me removed. I felt incomplete and very frustrated when I realized that I could never be like I was when I was born, intact. This frustration is with me to this day. Throughout life, I have regretted my circumcision. Daily, I wish I were whole. I just want to highlight that there's no mention of complications here. The person isn't saying, well, I had a botched circumcision or I had some severe laceration or something like that. Rather, it seems to be the case that simply just having had tissue removed without consent is sufficient in this case to uh, cause these uh, disturbed feelings. So in all of these cases, what you have is a sort of change of mind or perspective. The person went through much of their life sort of feeling like this is just the way things were, and then they gain a different perspective. Their genitals are still the same, but uh, all of a sudden their, their attitudes regarding what happened to them change, and this can have profound implications for how they view themselves and how they navigate through the world and engage in their sexual relationships and so on. I mean, there are dozens of other examples in the testimonial literature for male and female and intersex cases I could have drawn from, but this is a very common theme. It's not so much the case that you have to have a sort of medical or surgical um, error. It's the, the sheer involuntary loss of healthy tissue, the loss of genital intactness that's often felt as a harm. So how should we think about these cases? Uh, my colleagues and I have been uh, writing about the sort of interesting technology, it's a brain stimulation uh, device that people are now thinking they might use on their children to supposedly increase their numerical capacity by stimulating a certain part of the brain. Um, they've also thought about using this to affect memory. And this is an interesting uh, example that will help support the point I want to make because you can enhance long-term memory or short-term memory, but you sort of can't do both. They're wired up in the brain in such a way that you have a trade-off. So if you try to improve long-term memory by doing this brain stimulation, you might impair short-term memory and vice versa. And so we were asking, you know, is it permissible for parents to try to improve their children's memory in some way, given that it is going to come at a certain cost, or at least is likely that that's true? How should we evaluate this ethically? And here's what we came up with. We said, well, adults are in a position to decide whether effect X is valuable enough to them to justify incurring loss Y. But children do not yet have the capacity or the life experience to make such trade-off decisions. They don't know what they will value when they grow up, nor do their parents. So while an intervention that improves X may count as an enhancement for the individual who does not care much about Y, another individual, valuing Y over X, will view the very same outcome as an impairment. So in these sorts of cases, that is, cases in which the very status of an intervention as being an overall enhancement versus an impairment is controversial, and that certainly applies to all the cases of genital cutting that we're discussing, the weight of consideration should shift toward delaying the intervention until the individual who will be affected by it can uh, make a decision uh, uh, under uh, conditions of informed consent. And the more permanent and substantial the trade-off, the more this argument has force. So the implication of that is that non-therapeutic genital cutting should not be performed on children. The option should be left to the individual when they're an adult so they can make an informed decision. And this brings together these different genital cutting practices all along that spectrum that I opened with under one ethical paradigm that's focused on children's rights to bodily integrity and sexual autonomy and I think what's nice about this paradigm is that this is the case regardless of race, religion, culture, sex, or gender. So you eliminate in one fell swoop these double standards that are often racialized in a really uh, uh, unappealing way and, and often have these sort of gender differences as well that I don't think can be justified. Here it becomes more about children's capacity and consent. Now I've had some discussions with people who primarily advocate against female genital cutting and uh, they said, listen, I see your point that there's a lot of overlap between male and female and intersex, and I, I sort of concede some of these empirical observations you've made. But nevertheless, let's just keep these campaigns separate. I'm going to focus on anti-FGM stuff. You folks can do anti-circumcision stuff, and let's each leave well enough alone. And I don't think this is a, a very promising strategy, and that's what I'm going to sort of conclude with, is to argue that keeping these things completely separate is just not a good idea for anyone, including those who, as it were, only care about uh, eliminating female genital cutting. 
So D Dina Davis points out one of the problems with this. Uh, she says, as long as the US continues to countenance MGC, the criminalization of even the ritual Nick cannot fail to dilute the persuasiveness of the official stance against FGC while carrying the unmistakable taint of intolerance and double standards. Um, this is something that's come to light, uh, which is that those individuals who are strongly committed to perpetuating what they call female circumcision are not stupid. They see the double standards, and some of them, including members of the Dewudi Bora and others who are highly educated, uh, many of them scholars, are um, calling bullshit and pushing back. And so I, I just want to call your attention to this difficult and disturbing website about female circumcision. And um, this has been put up by supporters of female circumcision. And what's really troubling about this is that there's far more nuance and scholarly depth in this website than the World Health Organization policy, which is replete with these kind of rhetorical maneuvers to try to pull the wool over your eyes and pretend that male and female genital cutting are completely different. The point that FGC supporters are now making is that if you support male circumcision and you're intellectually honest and you don't want to just be bigoted against my group, then by rights you have to tolerate female circumcision as well. And the problem is that their argument is pretty good. And uh, this is why I think you can't treat these issues separately. And let me just get into uh, one example of this. So let's go down to the uh, consent and parental rights uh, argument for female circumcision. This is a quote from the website. Minors, by definition, are incapable of making decisions for themselves. Therefore, consent on behalf of minors is routinely provided by parents, where parents determine what is in the best interest of the child. And this sounds exactly like the playbook for supporters of male circumcision, doesn't it? This right is not limited by notions of bodily integrity and medical benefit alone. Rather, in securing the best interest of a child, parents rightly consider social, cultural, religious, and familial benefits and harms in addition to medical benefits and harms when making decisions. Now you see they have a hyperlink here, if you're wondering what that links to. It's uh, the AAP task force uh, report on circumcision, and they're just, they're, they're quoting, uh, quoting from the, the support that the AAP gives for male circumcision and says, listen, if that's your view, if it's not just about medical benefits and risks, but these social and cultural and other things, well, gee, female circumcision has those things too, so you should, you should give us uh, equal consideration. So they say male circumcision is by far the most prevalent procedure on male infants, and despite attempts to ascribe significant health benefit to it, it remains primarily a religious right. The procedure is not without risk, but since it is deemed culturally and legally acceptable, it is often overseen by medical professionals and performed in sanitary and controlled environments. Male circumcision is an excellent example of a religious procedure of contested health benefit that is nevertheless legally protected and made largely safe due to medicalization and regulation. Clearly, mere risk of potential harm is not sufficient to override parental consent and authority. However, parental authority for consent can be nullified in cases of serious harm, but mere bodily integrity is clearly not sufficiently compelling interest to override parental authority, for if it were, male circumcision wouldn't be tolerated. So they conclude, it's our assertion that female circumcision, if performed correctly under medical supervision, causes no harm. And I've heard that from uh, defenders of male circumcision as well. I mean, we just had with the illustration of the 61-year-old woman that harm, of course, is the sort of thing that can come about not simply through having had a, a surgical complication, but the very lifelong harm can come about through uh, psychological mechanisms when you reflect on what's happened to your body without your consent. So um, the no harm uh, argument here is just not convincing. Um, they say, well, female circumcision is a practice that was briefly endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and many of us know that history. Uh, and still is promoted as an ethical alternative to unsupervised and unregulated genital cutting that's deemed to cross the medically safe line. As has been noted elsewhere on this site, female circumcision is anatomically similar to male circumcision. It's a nick, or a small removal of a portion of the littoral hood, which is an analogous structure in females as the foreskin in males. Now you might think, okay, well, here's some obscure website set up by you know, proponents of a, of a surgery, but why should we care about those arguments? Let's just keep doing our se separate campaigns. Well, I don't think that's any longer a viable response because um, it's, it's starting to be picked up by not so obscure uh, outlets such as the Journal of Medical Ethics here. Um, Kavita Shah Arora and Alan Jacobs, who primarily were known for defending ritual male circumcision, 
noticed the double standards and they realized that they were going to be backed into a corner if they tried to suggest that all forms of female genital cutting should be prohibited. And I, I have to give them credit for intellectual consistency here because in order to deal with that, they wrote a paper suggesting that, well, so-called minor forms of female circumcision should indeed be tolerated. And that was the logical conclusion of their support for male circumcision. And this was published in the leading uh, healthcare ethics journal in the world. Okay, so it's confined to academics, no big deal. Well, uh, The Economist came out with an editorial uh, just last year, I believe, um, basically endorsing the arguments of uh, Aurora and Jacobs, saying after 30 years of attempts to eradicate a barbaric practice, it continues, it's time to try a new approach, and the new approach is tolerance for female circumcision. So these and other mainstream sources now explicitly rely on the presumed moral and legal acceptability of non-therapeutic religious male circumcision to justify arguments in favor of female circumcision. And this is a growing trend. I think it's worth pushing back against, and I think the way to do that is to have a coherent and conjoined effort on the part of advocates for children's rights to emphasize that it's the lack of consent that's the main ethical issue. This is something that, of course, applies equally across sexes and genders when you're dealing with a small child. Now, the response to this that, that uh, opponents will make is they'll say, well, listen, uh, children, young children can't consent to anything. And there are all sorts of things that parents can authorize for their children. So merely appealing to a lack of consent is not sufficient. And indeed, it is not. But I think it needs to be bolstered by pointing out that the genitals are not like other parts of the body. And the sorts of risks to which you might be exposed by playing sports, as is often raised, is a comparable uh, case. I mean, I don't need to go through the bad analogies because everyone here has heard them 100 times. But I think it, it needs to be clear that it is the lack of consent that's the main issue and that the genitals are, are special. And everybody knows that. And when they start talking about you know, ear piercing and, and, and football, um, it's dishonest. That's clearly not the same sort of thing. Now, these points hold true regardless of net health consequences, uh, positive or negative, and they hold regardless of parental motivation. And I think this is important because this sort of argument is going to be impervious to empirical refutation. This is what I was talking about, about the no health benefits for FGM thing. Don't hold your argument hostage to that, because if somebody goes along and comes up with some health benefits, you have to concede your case. And why would you want to leave yourself exposed to that kind of argument? Even if there were health benefits, you should be on strong moral footing to say that that's actually not sufficient to make the practice permissible. And so we can move away from this sort of distraction about whether there are health benefits or not. And then also this issue of the, you know, parents or communities inner motivations, this unmeasurable thing about what, what is the real reason why they're doing these procedures. Well, it's really different in the case of boys and girls. I mean, it, it, um, when you look at the full range of practices in different societies, you just see far too much overlap for that to be true on the sort of system level. But also, you can't get inside any individual parent's head and assess the true reason for why they're doing it. Any reason that they give you is going to be sufficient as long as they say the right one. So, Again, don't hold your argument hostage to what the real motives are, because if somebody comes along and says, well, in this culture, that's not the motive, you know, to control female sexuality, let's say, then you say, oh, well, I guess in that culture, it's okay. I don't think that's what people want to say. So don't leave yourself hostage to those kinds of developments in the literature. So I think that this is the strongest argument for anti-FGC, anti-MGC, and anti-IGC campaigns across the board is the consent and the specialness of the genitals issue. Um, and I don't want to pour salt in anyone's wounds here, but, but I think that this implies that we're stronger together and uh, uh, proceed as a sort of unified front focusing on, on children's rights. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I, I think there's some time for questions. I, I don't know how much time I actually took, but is there half an hour or so? Yes, sir. Yes, just a comment. Uh, your great manager, Hillary Clinton, is stronger together. That was the uh, comical yes. illusion attempt yes. that I made okay, at the end that's there. Fine. Yeah. My nickname for that bitch is Cuddly Clinton. Well, I, I take your point. What she's done in Africa. Yeah. It's a distraction to the point that I was trying to make, but I hear what you're saying. Yeah, Mark. Little humans with penises, but they're all just little humans. To what extent 
is a lot of this ingrained in the idea across cultures that boys are tougher, girls are delicate and need to be protected. Uh, boys can endure this, boys should endure things like this. And girls are sugar, spice, and everything nice, and boys are snips and snails and yeah. One thing that's interesting about that when you dig into the anthropological literature is that that's sort of a, a notion that's peculiar to some Western contexts and is not actually common in all the cultures that practice male and female genital cutting. In fact, in many societies where son is a rite of passage, the girls are expected to be just as courageous and tough and strong as the boys, which is why they're being asked to show their uh, ability to withstand a painful experience on equal footing to the boys. So I think this sort of um, protective view that girls have to be saved from uh, you know, horrible practices, whereas the boys are going to be fine and they're tough, that certainly shapes the Western discourse. But I think, in a way, it misrepresents some of the, as it were, more local attitudes in some communities that practice both male and female forms. Yes? The Detroit case is so explicit in the double standards that are, that are there, but uh, as I've been sort of talking with some of the people involved with the case, the federal prosecutors are, have so swallowed the World Health Organization distinctions and rely on, on that document for how they evaluate the case that they're sort of just blind to what's going on. So you can, you can sit down in front of them and say, you know, for these people, it's a religious practice. And they'll say, well, according to the WHO, it has no basis in religion. And it's like, yeah, sorry, OK, here's the Hadith, and here's their religious leader, and here's all the reasons for that. So one fear I have is that this, the, the, the prevailing discourse, which has been propped up for some 30, 40 years now, is, is so, so strong that just despite just, just glaring inconsistencies, despite a, a glaring collision course in this case, um, somehow the jury will, through its prejudice and probably xenophobia and, and uh, anti-Muslim bias, I, I assume in this case, um, may very well just sort of reassert the dominant narrative. That's one possibility, despite the fact that that's, that's unsustainable, sort of on factual and, and conceptual grounds. Um, it's very unlikely that male circumcision in the United States on the basis of this particular uh, court case will suddenly become illegal. That's just impossible given the current state of the cultural discourse. Um, so I, I, I fear that some sort of tolerance for minor female genital cutting is not something that can be ruled out. And that's, that's why I argue that there needs to be um, some joining together of forces because it's gonna take more than just any one group to change the conversation so that the sort of parents' rights and religious authority stuff um, can get more dense in it so that when the time comes around to consider whether there might be restrictions uh, across the spectrum, people will be prepared for that thought. Um, but currently, I'm, I'm not sure the culture is prepared for that thought. Yeah, Georgian. I, I, there are some pockets of, uh, of movement in another direction, though, I have to say. So the first thing I've noticed is that in this last cycle of debate around, for example, the Iceland proposed bill, a lot of the uh, news reports will say, they'll quote the Icelandic politician, Gunnar Stadter, saying, well, we had female circumcision was illegal, so it only follows that we should have male circumcision be illegal. And even five years ago, any article that even floated the comparison between male and female circumcision would have been met with this barrage of this is completely, this is hate speech, this is violence against women, how could you possibly say such a thing? And now, although you still get those articles, proportionately, they're much fewer. And you start to see people just in normal 
unaffected conversation, say, gee, I guess that does sort of seem like a, a sensible way of comparing it, especially if some forms of FGC are relatively minor. Um, so that's changing. Also, you know, th there are really smart uh, uh, feminist anthropologists and sociologists, some of whom I write with, you know, Rebecca Steinfeld's a case, Ariane Chavisi, I've really enjoyed working with, and, and others who are, you know, respected mainstream scholars who are totally on board with these arguments. So it's not like, again, there's this monolithic opposition among certain feminist groups, that's not the case. And then in terms of anti-FGM campaigners, actually when the Iceland bill first came to light, I cannot remember who it is, I mean, I'm sad to say, but a very prominent anti-FGM uh, uh, leader tweeted out, you know, this is a brave, uh, this is a brave move, Iceland, congratulations. So I think there are, there, there is room for some optimism here, but there certainly are the holdouts of people who realize that it's you know, politically toxic, they don't want to go there, and they think to, to save their own boat, they've got to push others overboard. I think that's a bad long-term strategy, but many still think it's a good one now. Yeah, Carolyn. Okay. Um, having debated this with pediatricians, rabbis, lawyers, doctors, psychologists, and so forth, over the years, I find something that gets swept under the rug constantly that I have fairly strong feelings about, and that is there's a presumption that the foreskin has no function. When religious people, I'm debating, I think mean, God screwed up, this beautiful, perfect design, and then he deemed that this would have to be removed. The issue of sexual function in the foreskin is difficult. The definitive study on this, Marilyn participated in, hopefully with some incentive but for me, which just totally objectively proved that the removal of lots of sensitive tissue, seven times more sensitive than other adjacent tissue, uh, one has to construe from monofilament testing and sensitivity has some function. It may be impossible to prove that the other side publishes articles like they ask men who've been circumcised, hey, you like sex? Yeah, I like sex. See, it didn't have any effect on it. Yeah. It's a critical issue. And only because it can't be objectified, it gets swept under the rug. And as you mentioned, we can remove teeth to prevent decay, we can remove breast tissue to prevent breast cancer, and, and women can go on and on and on. And we do this in medicine uh, with that particular justification. And nobody seems to be able to sit down and say, hey, that's a really primal question to answer. And I can usually draw men in with a conversation around that. And in this era, forgive me for mentioning this, of, of, of rampant pornography available to everybody, there are a lot of men who get to see mm -hmm. what a foreskin does physically and certainly how it moves, et cetera, et cetera. We're not tapping into the emotional and pleasure centers of the brain. But I think this is a critical issue. Um, that has to be addressed. I, I met an East, an East African doctor a long time ago once who said to me, you know, when a woman is circumcised, this is what I first heard, and I used it, even though you have articulated it beautifully, that the woman is cleaner and that she, she is more preferred by, by men, uh, there's less infection, so forth and so on. And that could usually stop a lot of arguments because when they come at you with the health benefits of circumcision, they say, what if I propose to you? All right, I, sometimes I lie. So you know there's data that shows that women who have uh, FGM are healthier. Would you therefore support that? And that usually stops yeah. right there. Uh, but I, I, I think we have to deal with the function of the force. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, there's some difficulty in that because, again, I don't think that you want to hold hostage an argument to some particular scientific study coming out by some particular group that suggests that there's this many nerve endings versus that many nerve endings because there's a whole army on the other side willing to pump counter crap into the literature. And so, you know, and they'll come up with a systematic review and they'll say that, that, you know, that's a poor quality study. So I wouldn't want to rest any arguments on that. But what I've tried to do recently, uh, Rebecca Steinfeld, who I just uh, mentioned, she and I wrote a paper uh, called Genital Autonomy and Sexual Wellbeing. And what we did there is we referred to some evidence that uh, uh, among those who have been uh, circumcised, those who are circumcised without their consent, have a much higher proportion of uh, feeling very resentful and that this attitude can negatively affect their sexual lives. And so this, again, is something where I, I say, you know, I think getting into tallies of nerve endings is a mistake, partly because there's this whole 20,000 nerve endings thing. There's not very good evidence uh, of that. And many, many people here know this kind of weaving story by which that number came into existence. But I, I wouldn't rest a moral argument on a contestable empirical claim, particularly when the empirical thing is really hard to study, namely subjective sexual experience. Um, where's Steve Svoboda? Are you around, Steve? Steve, so you know Sarah Johnstadter wrote a really thoughtful reply to one of your articles. 
yeah, called uh, Against Genital Determinism. You talk about the subjectivity of sexual experience. That's right, and the difficulty of studying it from a scientific perspective, and the fact that uh, it's, not, it's not just down to sort of details about genital anatomy, but it's largely, obviously, sex is a psychological experience, and so you're, that has a, a big effect as well. So I, I certainly agree that in terms of basic education, if people just don't understand that the foreskin is very sensitive, that, that needs to be uh, a, a, an educational move, but I'm just wary of resting too much on something that could potentially be, but I, I don't want to say refute it, because a lot of these studies are very poor quality. I mean, a whole other area of research I do is the sort of uh, reliability of the published literature, and there's these replication crises going on, and people not sure if the medical literature is reliable. And so it's, it, there's a lot of room for politics, where you can have studies that look perfectly legitimate but that aren't very good quality, and I just don't want to rest too much on that debate. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. There was a long plane ride from Australia here, so I had some time to read a couple of your papers. All right. I've got some very interesting looks from the people sitting next to me. <laughs> yeah. I've had that writing them on planes as well. <laughs> but I just want to quickly thank you, because for me, as an activist, this is like the holy grail of getting the, the breakdown ethically, getting into the ethical arguments so succinctly and persuasively is really helpful for my toolkit. Um, the, but the question I have is when uh, advocating on the street, public are at a whole different level mm -hmm. in, in general, not everyone, but in general. And for me, typically as an activist, it's, it's about being as influential as possible and working to the level that they're at. Yeah. So the, the, the way I put it is, it's not about being right as an activist, it's about eliciting changes in behaviour. Yeah. And so this is the holy grail of right. This mm -hmm. is great at a dinner party, you, 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 you know, your, your left-wing friends just break them down. Mm -hmm. but Yeah. Um, and they're more, they're more steadfast in their view, the circumcision towards the I'm a lunatic talking about FGM. Yeah. So how do we bridge that gap? Because typically I try and stay with work with where they're at and yeah. just pick something that where we may pain might resonate with them or functionality or pleasure yeah. or whatever it is. And I just work with that. So how can I bridge the gap? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a really good question. I, I think it's not necessarily a choice between being right and being persuasive. And I think there's a risk sometimes when there's a little too much fast and looseness with things that are defensible claims, because then when somebody comes back and maybe you, they were persuaded in the moment and then they do a little more research and find out you kind of made up a figure or pressed a point a little too hard, then all of a sudden you've lost whatever ground you may have gained. So I think you have to do both. You have to be right and careful and uh, spot on with what claims you can justify and which you can't, while at the same time being very mindful of what it means to be persuasive. And there, I mean, there's, there's a whole literature on the psychology of persuasion, but a lot of it has to do with meeting people where they are, like you said, um, not putting people on the defensive, um, uh, addressing things in such a way that they'll feel like they don't have to be, uh, uh, they don't have to sort of admit that they were wrong and stupid to accept your view. So finding ways that you can allow people to save face while coming over to your view. So, I mean, it would be nice to see actually some more specific literature about the psychology of persuasion to do with these particular kinds of, uh, you know, um, uh, morally toxic uh, conversations. But, um, but, but I think it's a matter of doing both. And, and I think you're right that you have to be very sensitive to where the other person is and not try to barrel over them. Yeah, go ahead. I'm only, uh, I'm only aware of the AHA Foundation, and I understand what Ion Kersey has gone through, and I see her videos, and she understands the concept. She has not been allowed to go there. Yeah. She, she uh, was invited to, uh, you know, just, she was invited to speak at Oberlin College, and a liberal college, and because she dared question Islam, she was disinvited because she questioned religion. Yeah. Um, Rebecca Steinfeld, I met her back in 2011 during the FGM, uh, our SFMGM bill campaign. We had a very good conversation. She dared say, uh, I came out and, and supported this. I had no idea at the time. The repercussions were she was on a board at a North uh, London synagogue, yeah. which I didn't find out until much later. She got trampled. 
yeah. traitor, uh, self-hating Jew, mm. anti-Israel. She got trounced to death. So you can understand why the other side doesn't want to work with us, although it's so clear to anybody the hypocrisy that, that um, is coming from the United States, mainly. Um, so with that background, I, oh, I didn't want to make a, a, a one more comment about Rebecca. So I have tremendous respect for what she did and the hateful behavior that she endured for daring to speak up. She's not alone, it happens all the time. However, and it's completely, uh, I completely understand it, at the symposium in Kiel, she went through a very long uh, program of uh, intellectually talking about how to go ahead to, uh, with uh, ending of what I just said, we should never try to make a law ending. Hmm. So I understand where she's coming from, but we, that's well, not going to get where we're going. So to yeah. wind up after all this, yeah. um, the AHA Foundation, very brave, I am. Uh, 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 Rebecca Steinfeld, extremely brave, perhaps a bit naive, but she learned her lesson, didn't she? Who do we talk to in the FGM movement who will work with us? I think that's the question. It's not like we have to work with them. We all kind of know who is there who will take the, um, the, the um, go there when so many others have and they've just been crucified. Great, really. So if, if you know anybody has those people who work, we're, we're desperate to work with them. Yeah, um, uh, Ayn Hirsi Ali is an interesting case because she does uh, well know that there's overlap between male and female genital cutting, and she's on record saying that. Um, but her her organization, the AHA Foundation, hasn't hasn't waded into those waters at all, and actually repeats some of the same kind of tired language that comes from the WHO and so forth in in a way that is particularly bothersome because of her her obvious awareness of the issue. Um, it's hard to know what to say about that case. Um, with respect to that, I want to say one thing about the law question. You say, well, the ultimate goal should be a law. I think the ultimate goal should be to not have childhood genital cutting. Uh, the law is actually one potential means of doing that, but maybe not a very effective one. So I just think the goal has to be no more childhood genital cutting. The goal certainly should not be a law. If it's the case that a law were the most effective way of bringing that about, then I would support that. But recent history suggests that without adequate preparation, you get these backfiring effects where then in Germany, for example, it's now going to be much harder to make a legal claim because uh, the groundwork wasn't laid um, before that regional court decision. Similarly, in, in San Francisco, uh, you can't, can't uh, even, I, I guess, challenge the, the, the practice anymore legally. And so I, I, think that, I think that we have to keep separate what the goals are. Is it to have a law or is it to stop childhood genital cutting? And unless you can really convince me that those are the same thing, and currently I don't think they are, then I at least understand where Rebecca's coming from. I don't know if she said we never want this to happen or something like that. I wasn't she there. She said but. she didn't want to. Well, there's, you can have laws of the yin yang, but unless they're in court, yeah. it's not going to stop. Yeah, them. FGM is illegal uh, in, in, in all sorts of countries with 80% rates of it practice. It empower the victims to come forward yeah. and give them a base to, uh, to stop this. And this is what we have to do is we have to empower people. A law is not going to stop anything certainly makes things think, people think. And uh, the biggest problem that we have is medicalization of this. And uh, if you can come after a doctor for doing this, this is like 90% of it right there, going after the medical part of it, like the doctor, female doctor in, the, yeah. in Michigan, and the doctors who are the worst. Potential inroad that may be more promising. Yeah, speaking of which. Yeah, he is uh, sort of informally consulting, as I understand. Are, are, are there lawyers saying, actually, if I were, I don't do criminal law, I would be doing something about this. Yeah. Because it's not just the law and the aggregate system that we're trying to fail by challenging the statute itself on this basis of equal protection. That, I think, that's where I think the court is going to headwork. They know you can't afford this to get through because it's irrational. Yeah. Okay.
So the first move that the defense is going to make is to suggest that um, actually the doctor's not guilty of infringing on the federal statute because it has very peculiar language that says something like no person shall circumcise or otherwise excise. It doesn't just say across the board any non-therapeutic genital cutting, which language would be so clear that a sort of double standard couldn't be avoided. In this case, because they have specific terminology that's very ill-defined, what the defense is going to first try to say is that mutilation as defined by this statute hasn't occurred. That's what they'll say. If they are, uh, um, uh, if the mutilation uh, definition is accepted by the judge, then they're going to move to religious freedom. Uh, that's their sort of backup why phrase. Why don't they just go ahead and challenge the statute on equal protection? Yeah, I mean, I. Yeah. I'm curious about that. Well, the way that judges tend to rule on these things is they try to rule on them as narrowly as possible because they obviously don't want to have to put themselves on the line for potentially rewriting you know, decades of law. And so I have a feeling that uh, the judge in this particular case is going to try to rule on it in such a way as not to have to trigger a chain up to the Supreme Court. But um, if, if the defense is successful in, in, in arguing its case, which again, it's, it's it's going to be really hard for it to do because there's a lot of prejudice against this community uh, among the you know, jurors so far who have heard cases about uh, child protection. So um, there's this bit where the, the doctor's children are being taken away from her um, because she's this evil mutilator in, in the eyes of the jury. And um, of course, the same jury would not take children away from a, a moyol or something like that. And so I think there's a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of an uphill battle just to get the, the, the views taken seriously, saying, you know, um, uh, there really is a double standard here. Uh, and so it's just a question of how that will go. But I, I, I mean, I'm not a prognosticator, so I just can't say for sure. Have they consulted you on this? They sent me an email, and I've uh, politely kept some distance because um, it's really important for me to have intellectual and academic independence. And I think if in any way I was seen as potentially in, in, you know, in the pocket of the defense or something like that. I've, I've told them that I have two things that really bother me. One is general cutting of children. The other is hypocrisy and racism. And I think there's a lot of hypocrisy and racism going on when it comes to the treatment of this group. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in conflict with myself in that regard because I am sort of have two things that really bother me. Yeah, Tim. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one, one strategy, um, and I, I think it's true, so I, I'm hesitant to call it a strategy, which sounds like it's merely instrumental, but is to say, listen, let's say all you care about is ending genital cutting of girls, and you don't care at all what happens to boys and intersex children. Even so, it's in your interest to come on board with these uh, gender-neutral arguments. And so I've been trying to move in that direction in some recent papers to say, listen, Let's just say for the sake of argument that you're perfectly fine with what's happening to boys personally or something like that, and you really feel that the, the moral goal is what's happening to girls for various reasons. Um, even so, you're going to be on the, on the wrong train if you continue to try to keep these matters separated because the long-term winning arguments are going to have to be framed in gender-neutral terms. Yeah. Oh, one more thing let me just say about the AAP. So, um, uh, a doctor came to Yale some six months ago, Ashley was there, and um, gave a talk that was titled, you know, The Ethics of Circumcision, and I thought, oh boy, you know, what's this going to be? And then I found out, furthermore, that he's sort of recently been appointed to be on the AAP Bioethics Committee. So I was particularly anxious, and I thought, oh, right, okay. 
And I went and watched it, and I have to say, I, I, I wish I could remember his name off the top of my head. Um, he gave a presentation very little different to one I would have given. And I thought, oh, what's that all about? So the AP now, people are saying, including me, the policy is now expired. I guess every five years, unless they renew them, sort of in some technical sense, that's true. But I, I think it's basically still in force. Um, if they come around to revisit the issue, it's the case that at least one very thoughtful person who's clearly done his homework is now on the committee. And so that may make a difference, but you know, I, I, putting too much stake in that would be a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say that since uh, in 1979, when I was at the Prison Prison and began talking, I was alone. Mm -hmm. And nobody, I had nobody else talking about it. And, it, and it, I was no longer invited to birthday parties or weddings or showers. Mm -hmm. or, and back to what real people are inviting me now. But it, well, over the years, I mean, the watch has changed. The idea that we started no sick with was to say no to sick with mm -hmm. And we, we uh, talked a lot about the harm that was done to babies and, and people becoming aware of what trauma does to the elasticity of the mm -hmm. developing brain and so forth. And we've come to that, so what we've done is raise consciousness about that. So we changed our name to genital autonomy mm -hmm. to include all children. Yeah. And people say, well, why did you do that? And they're having a hard time. So it was my, and my response to that is, this has been 40 years we've been doing this. Yeah. And we can see it will win. Yeah. And now let's change it to raising consciousness about uh, protecting every child. Every child has, has a right to their own body. And that will, that will come. We just have to keep talking. Yeah, I think that's so exactly not, right. And not be afraid of it. Not be afraid of it. Oh, my God, if you do this, this is going to be really bad. But no. This is what you do. You set the standard. We set the standard. Yeah. And let people uh, raise their, their mind to the joint. Yeah, I think that's right. And on some of the sort of gen genital autonomy materials, it's been, it's been really heartening to see that the argument's been phrased in this more inclusive way. I think that that needs to be done even more. So for example, it's often the case that the um, illustration will be a baby boy, usually a white baby boy. And I think it would be nice to have uh, people from different ethnic backgrounds of different genders and that given is, is sort of equal attention to show that we're really sincere. It's not just like, anti-circumcision and oh yeah, I guess maybe genital autonomy. It's like genital autonomy, that's the thing here. And I think if we lead with sincerity, other people will see that it's not just a side issue, but that you know, boys, girls, and intersex children really do equally deserve uh, uh, equal consideration. And that said, I, I should say that Tim Hammond, Tim Hammond brought a, a poster. Yeah. He and James Bowen did years ago, yeah. showing that it was a, 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 um, a black and, you know, mm -hmm. and they, they can look at it, he's brought the poster Right. To be handed out free here. Uh, there's a box between, uh, well, between um, the book pages, I think. Oh, wonderful. You just you know, pick up a poster and look, you can see right on the front of the box what the poster is. That's great. Right. Yeah. Good to hear. Yeah. Uh, yes? Hi. Uh, yeah. I have, um, since I've gotten some slack when I posted this online, but um, first of all, I'll say this is not the way I want to end, but it might be the way it might end. The, with female circumcision, okay. Instead of doing the more drastic versions where they you know, cut off the whole thing and in tribulation, now they're doing much smaller versions of it and just the nicking. And I, there are doctors around who are doing what we call mini surf, where they cut off a little bit. It's, can we, I have wondered if this might be ultimately the way it will come to an end, that if these guys are going off with maybe three fourths of a foreskin, mm -hmm. someday become fathers who are like, more glad to leave their sons intact. Somehow, somehow, and I've seen it with other things within medical practices, mm -hmm. that people have to let go. We can't just stop it over and We have to let go and go to um, Well, we won't, in this case, instead of putting all the four skins cut off, just a little bit. Yeah, so, yeah. It's not the way I want it to be. Or it might be a step along the way. Uh, Robert Darby has made the point in, in some or another uh, of an article of his that if it were the case that uh, ritual nicking were allowed or tolerated, that still wouldn't even up the score because of course, removal of the foreskin is far more invasive than that. And so he says, actually, if you, if you really are doing this because you're motivated for sex and gender equality, you need to also move to something like a foreskin nicking or something like that. And so um, th this has been proposed and I think my own take is that I tend to be very pragmatist because as I say, my only goal is to try to change the conversation such that less genital cutting happens. And if it's the case that some of these 
stopgap measures along the way would, as a matter of fact, have that outcome, might be open to them, but it's really hard to know because the, the dynamics of social change are very hard to study. You sometimes get these kind of butterfly effects where you think you're changing norm in one direction, but actually you're having unintended con consequences elsewhere. So the sort of science of how to change norms is something that is, is, is um, fairly well uh, uh, studied, and I think it would be worth looking at it from a sort of very dispassionate uh, sort of uh, scientific mindset and say, what works? And yeah, yeah. And, and just thinking in terms of long-term strategy. Because I think it's very tempting when you have a clear moral argument, which I think is well justified, to, to jump immediately to the sort of purist position and say it's, it's my way or the highway, it's all or nothing. And again, f for me the main goal is eventually this has got to stop and what's the best way of doing that? And, and I think we have to be open to a range of potential pathways. I was in contact once with a, a man who uh, was Jewish, and he, he really didn't believe in circumcision. He had three sons. The first one was circumcised the regular way. The second one, they had a bridge, and the, uh, this man came to doctor and felt it cut off just a little bit, and it didn't look like the cow had been mm -hmm. done at all. And then the third son, they just left in half. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Sort of illustrating the, the principle. Oh, thanks for that story. Uh, yes? I know that Georgian at some point has talked with Andrew Friedman and sort of tried to get a little bit inside his head and his thinking, and it's, it's, it's very peculiar. You know, I think he, Georgian, where are you? Uh, you know, you said he, he wants everybody to like him, and so he sort of admits that, yeah, the medical case isn't so good, but, you know, it's an important tribal thing, and that should be allowed, and we should kind of somehow all get along. And it's, it's, it's I don't know, maybe you'll talk about it at some other point, but it's very peculiar, the sort of particular makeup of that committee and the particular sorts of uh, things they were trying to accomplish as, as evidenced by Friedman's editorial in, in 2016. It's very confusing, but um, if the policy is revisited, it might be different people. I've suggested that at least one person will be different. So uh, who knows, but um, yeah. What I'm suggesting is maybe a group of us Jews should write something and approach them as a Jewish group to say that we, you know, what disturbs us, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if anybody here is willing to do it, and I don't yeah. Uh, 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 uh
Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead back there. You can make an organization very efficient by naming over and over to make organizations. Yeah. Well, there are, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's possible. There's, there's this online group called Jews Against Circumcision that I think David Balashinsky is mainly the administrator for. And as far as I understand, he wrote a letter to try to appeal to the Icelandic folks and you know, got not very many signatures. And so I think part of it is, you know, um, it, it really shouldn't be just in name only. I take your point. But, you know, there's, there's got to be actually, uh, I think, more concerted effort to, to, to get genuine communication and, and collaboration between people who maybe have a shared perspective that they could bolster in some way. Um, because I think a lot of times people say, eh, it's just a website, we shouldn't really take it seriously. And, and sometimes I think that's maybe hurt, hurt the cause. Uh, yeah, Georgiana. Yeah, an explicitly religious kind of. Had your hand up for a while, yes? Would you mind sharing what first brought you to this issue? Sure. Um, uh, so, uh, actually, it's a good story. You'll like this story, Marilyn. Uh, when I was in high school, I was uh, trying to apply to colleges, and my family didn't have a lot of money. So one thing I was doing was applying for scholarships of various kinds. And so part of that was these essay competitions that would come up, where you would just write an essay and try to win $1,000 here and there. And one essay that came up was, uh, the Ethics of Circumcision put on by NOSIRC you know, back when I was 17. And I just went, oh, I never thought about this before. And uh, I wrote a little essay and sent it in. I think I got an honorable mention or something like that. Didn't win, didn't win the money. Um, and, and then I sort of forgot about it for about 10 years. Um, and circumcision was not a, a very big deal for me in the Pacific Northwest. Some people were circumcised, some people weren't. I didn't have particularly strong feelings about it. When I did the research for this essay, I started to think, huh, there's something peculiar going on here, but it wasn't a preoccupation for me. And then uh, when I was working in Oxford some years later, my boss there asked that we publish a blog post every month commenting on something in the news. And I had sort of run out of things to say that month, and I saw maybe it was the MGM bill, maybe it was what was going on in Cologne, maybe it was the AAP 2012 thing, I'm not sure what it was, there was a confluence of events that were in the news. And I said, gosh, you know, I think I have an essay from like 10 years ago on my hard drive that I could just kind of dust off and be done with my monthly blog post. So I pulled it up and plopped it online and figured that would be the end of it. And it just kind of exploded where there was quite a lot of very intense debate going on in the comments section. And I hadn't realized that I had stirred a very uh, intense bee's nest. And so um, around that time, the Cologne decision happened. And I said to my boss, Julian, I said, you know, the Journal of Medical Ethics, which she edits, should do a special issue on this topic because I think it's going to be a big bioethical debate in the, in the corner. You, you want to get ahead of that. And he said, well, that sounds like a very good idea, but um, I, I don't have the time to do it. Why don't you do it? And I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't feel like I have enough uh, you know, uh, training to do this sort of thing. He said, you can do it. So uh, he, he, he's somebody who's been very supportive of me uh, from an academic perspective. And so I learned everything I could about the topic so that I could be competent in, in editing this special issue, which I then did do. And after that, I sort of knew a lot about the topic, and it becomes this self-reinforcing thing where then I get asked to review papers and then I write papers and so forth. So it was, it was totally by accident in my case. 
Um, but uh, I, I wanted to keep involved because I thought that uh, something really needed to change in the conversation. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, okay. So I guess there's time for one more question, and the idea is to speak up loudly. Uh, who's uh, Paul? Uh, yeah. I mean, you've got to really speak up because we're going to have microphones tomorrow, but not now. Yes, I, I certainly hope that's not the case. I, what I tried to say was a, was a claim that it, I, I don't think I can rule out that that might be the way that this tension gets resolved. But what I'm saying is yeah. there are, there's a logic to the way. There are other, there are many ways of, of cutting a pie, mm -hmm. and it's not a matter of, oh, well, it's not a very hard time down. You just cut four of next to the ball or One of them is what? I'm sorry. Time. Time. Mm -hmm. and right. The issue about our yes, yes. Um, I think it's the main issue. A five year old can choose better than a three day old. Mm -hmm. right? A 10 year old can choose better than a five year old. A 15 year old, he can do it right, she can do it. I don't care. Right? By the time the 15th century. There are people who have now the 18 years to mark that flag to be marked for that. Um, I think strategically, we need to be able to say that we are utterly opposed. That's that's absolutely right. I don't think ceding ground on the protection of girls is is in any way. What's that? No, not at all. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's alternative uh, rituals that are being proposed and so forth. I, I, I think that you're absolutely right. I, I think that the right direction to go is not to say, well, our compromise is let's sort of, uh, you know, relax a little bit the, the gains that have been made in terms of protecting girls' gender autonomy. Not at all. Um, and so thinking creatively about how to uh, hold that uh, line while Continually making gains for intersex and male children, I think, is the direction we should pursue. So, I think that might be all the time we have. It's not up to me, but uh, can we all thank Brian? Like, yeah. really? Yeah. 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 Really? Good conversation. I think I've got all my stuff. You get the That's not mine. So, yeah, I've got my stuff. All right. So now we have a meet and greet.